Okay, uh, great. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, so, uh, first thing to mention, so I don't forget, um, these slides, if you want a local copy, are available here. So, my website slash files slash colloquium hyphen uneda hyphen in rzk dot pdf. And I will be referring to a formalization uh, repository, which the web version of it is here. So, website again slash uneda. Okay, uh, so right. what I'm going to describe is a uh, computer formalization project that uh, three of us, so uh, Jonathan Weinberger and Nikolai Kudasov and I uh, launched about a year ago, and we've had some more contributors since. Those are the other names on here. Um, and what this aims to do is uh, formalize a particular sort of mathematics, which is my research specialty, so something called infinity category theory. So the reason I want to tell you about this is um, to make kind of a broader point on what excites me about the potential of using computer, formula, computer proof assistance within mathematics. And um, the potential I see is that it might be a way to make very complicated mathematics simpler and still rigorous using the trick of formalizing results not in set theory necessarily, but in some formal system, some uh, peg theory perhaps, uh, that is uh, optimized for the particular subject area of mathematics. So I have a maybe political motivation for this talk, and it's to promote the idea that we should be supporting a healthy ecosystem of um, Lots of experimental proof assistants that are not meant to be universal, so not meant to be the one math library that contains all of mathematics, but could be specialized for a particular research area with the aim of providing a framework to, with, to do rigorous formal proofs in that one area that are a lot simpler. So that's the meta point that I'm going to make today. And I'm going to get in some of the details of how those ideas played out in this project as a case study of what that might look like. Um, please ask questions. Okay, so um, right. uh, here's the kind of plan for the talk. So I, I often uh, speak about this to audiences that know nothing about computer formalization. So the first uh, bit you know, gives a little bit of a motivation for computer formalization. And in this case, I'm not going to go through these specific details, but I'll just say that I'm also in one of these areas of mathematics where there have been some high profile mistakes in the literature. Um, this is an anecdote uh, described by Vladimir Vrybotsky about one of the mistakes he found in his own work. And what's interesting about this is uh, the clear contradiction between two claimed results was in 1998 and the resolution was in 2013. So it was just not so clear which of these two ideas was the correct one because the mathematics fundamentally is very difficult. And if you uh, are going to write out everything rigorously, it just takes a really long time. And this was one of the experiences that led Wojtowski to stop doing pen and paper mathematics and start learning type theory. You know, he famously took an undergraduate type theory course at Princeton and then um, you know, wanted a computer tool to help check his work. He didn't want to wait 15 years to know if his lemma was correct. He wanted uh, some more immediate feedback. OK. So, Again, when I'm presenting this to mathematicians who haven't heard of anything about formalization, I have to sort of tell them a little bit about um, what uh, has been done already. And I think the most useful point of comparison for this talk is the liquid tensor experiment. Um, I don't know if anybody here was involved in that directly. No? OK. But I mean, the point of it is it was like extremely hard. I mean, this is, you know, this is a so the liquid tensor experiment that refers to a uh, proof of uh, Peter Schulze, um, that he doubted the accuracy of his own proof. And like Wojtowski, he didn't trust the community to check it for him sufficiently carefully, sufficiently quickly. And so it was put out as a challenge to try to do a computer formalization. This required a massive amount of homological algebra and lots of other things to be formalized in the way. And it was all done in like a year and a half. So that's a, that's a very, very cool accomplishment. Okay. I mean, not the only notable success, but good enough for now. OK, so now I want to tell you a little bit about um, the problem of formalizing results in my specific research area, which is higher category theory or infinity category theory. Um, so, uh, 
So infinity category theory is like kind of out there. I mean, there's, you know, to some mathematicians, category theory is already kind of out there because it involves something very abstract, namely like a notion of a, a category. Um, there's a, a joke in category theory that this is an area where you need to give examples of your examples because, uh, you know, the examples themselves are sort of so far removed from the real world that it's only examples of that that get back to like the real world of undergraduate mathematics, which of course is not at all the real world. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, but there's also this like infinity business, and, and what it, so what infinity refers to in the setting of in, in, uh, infinity category theories. So sort of in, in a category, you have some sort of mathematical objects, and you have morphisms between them. But then you can imagine having morphisms between the morphisms, and morphisms between the morphisms, and between the morphisms, and so on, sort of all the way up. Um, so that's one sense in which these objects are large, as there's sort of countably infinitely many levels of data to define them. Um, and moreover, everything is assumed to be sort of only weak. So there's, there's more data than you might think you need even to have countably infinitely dimensions of morphisms. I mean, another problem is that the examples are all very large. So, you know, to give the, the sort of real examples of infinity categories that mathematicians consider um, are uh, not definable in set theory without an inaccessible cardinal. And so, you know, a, a, you know, I have, I have a book on infinity category theory, and we start by assuming three levels of inaccessible cardinals because, like, you need that to make the work rigorous. So, so anyway, it's kind of a kind of an out there sort of subject. But but that, now let me try and connect to formalization. So, I mean, if you're if you're going to formalize some sort of mathematical concept, you need to start by giving a rigorous definition of the mathematical concept. I mean, if you don't know what your thing is rigorously, like you have no hope of formalizing it. So let's try to do this for this notion of infinity. Infinity category, so that that's a mathematical thing we could try to formalize it, and um, when it's explained, you know, from one mathematician to another, it's usually explained via an analogy. So you know, you're speaking to somebody who already knows what a one category is, and that's something that you can define in the language of set theory. So if you don't know what a one category is, it's okay, but it's you know, it's it involves a set and then some other sets and some functions between those sets and some equations between those functions. Like that's a normal definition in set theory. And so then the idea of an infinity category theory, of it, sorry, an infinity category is we just replace all those sets by something called an infinity groupoid, which is like vaguely like a topological space. Really, it's only a topological space up to weak homotopy equivalents, and that's kind of a lot worse, but uh, whatever. Um, so, so what do I mean by replace the sets by infinity groupoids? So, uh, you know, categories have a set of objects, so infinity categories have an infinity groupoid of objects, okay. Uh, Categories have sets of morphisms between a fixed pair of objects, so infinity categories should have these, they call them mapping spaces, infinity group words. But the sort of more complicated bit is the rest of it. So, um, you know, when you have your set of objects and set of morphisms, then there are sort of axioms, you know, you have some functions between these, and these functions commute, and those are expressed easily in the language of set theory. But we need to replace all of that uh, in an infinity categorical way or in sort of infinity groupoid theory. And um, you know, maps between infinity groupoids aren't really functions in the sense that maps between sets are functions. And it's because of this, I didn't really give you a definition of an infinity groupoid, but it's, it's a space sort of only defined up to homotopy. And let's think of one example of this. Um, uh, so there's this notion of, so a very simple example of a topological space is a singleton. That's a space. But if I think about spaces that are like singletons up to homotopy, that's this notion of contractible space. And there are contractible spaces in all dimensions, so these can be extremely large. And um, you know, so it's and in particular, you, the question like how many points does your your infinity group would have doesn't make sense because the answer could be one or it could be uncountably infinitely many, and somehow it's the same space. So, so there's there's um, you know sort of capturing this rigorously within set theory is just a little bit subtle because you know, you're used to building a space by starting with points and then putting on a topology and starting with points, you've already made a mistake. You know? But of course, if you want to build an example of it in set theory, you do have to start with points because yeah, everything's a set in set theory. So that's kind of why this is complicated. So what I've not done on this slide is give a definition of infinity categories within set theory. It is possible to do this, but what I'm trying to explain instead is why it's sort of unnatural and complicated to do that. Okay. So this, yeah, so this is some object that some mathematicians study, and it's difficult to even say what it is in, in set theory, though people do. Um, uh, okay, so this is meant to, 
um, give a little bit of an illustration. So, so, so part of the points is like part of the point I'm making here is what makes this difficult is things are not like well defined in the ordinary sense. And I want to give an example of how the extent to which things are well defined in the infinity categorical world, um, which is just a little bit different than in the classical world. So the simplest example of an infinity category is something called the total singular complex or the fundamental infinity groupoid of a space X. So this capital letter X here is actually an ordinary topological space. So you can imagine the surface of your favorite manifold or, or whatever you want. And um, when I'm thinking about this space as being some sort of infinity category, I should think about the points in the space as being the objects. So the little x, y, and z here are three points in some ambient space. And I should think about the morphisms in the infinity category as being paths in the space. So this f and this g are paths through some space between uh, from the point x to y and then from the point y to z. So the fundamental thing you want to do in a category is compose arrows. That's, you know, that's what makes a directed graph of your category is this composition operation. But it works a little bit differently in um, the fundamental infinity groupoid. So you, I mean, you might think like you could just take the path f and the path g and concatenate them, and that gives you a composite path, and that is totally true. But for a reason, um, it's maybe a little bit complicated to explain. Any path from x to z, like this path k that I've drawn here, that is equipped with a two-dimensional homotopy. So that's like a map from the continuous, or from the sort of solid triangle, in, into the space with the boundary f g k. So any data compared with that path k and this homotopy, which you should think of as some two-dimensional thing filling in the triangle, is equally a composite of f and g. And it's better somehow not to prefer one composite to the others, because um, you can't really make choices in a kind of coherent and compatible way. So it's better to just deal without choices. So in other words, um, in this sort of setting, there's no longer a unique composite of paths, but there's a whole bunch of different composites, probably uncountably infinitely many. Um, but what um, passes for uniqueness, or what encodes the sort of up to homotopy or up to infinity uniqueness, is this theorem that says that the space of composites of two paths uh, F and G are contractible. Okay, and I'm going to give a little bit of the proof of the theorem because I want to construct the space. And the reason I want to construct the space is um, jumping a little bit ahead. This is an example of an extension type, and um, extension types are going to come up in just a second. So, um, so I want to define a space whose points are composites of my fixed path F and G. Okay, so I mentioned that the data of a composite of f and g is given by this other path k together with this homotopy. And the homotopy is a continuous map from a triangle into my space, capital X. And so that's what this space is here. This map delta x is the space of continuous maps from the triangle into x. So that's sort of approximately this space of composites. But if I just map an arbitrary triangle into x, like that might not have anything to do with f and g. So I need to say that when I restrict to this part of the triangle, it was exactly the path f and g. And that's accomplished by, firstly, if I take an arbitrary continuous map from a triangle into x, I can restrict down to get the continuous map from that boundary bit into x. And then I can pick out a particular point in this space, namely the one that encodes the path f and g. And so the subspace of that mapping space that strictly restricts to this is the space of composites. So that's an example of an extension type, exactly. So we say later, extension types will come back in a moment. Yeah? Um, so you have f and g here, but I thought that like the whole point here was, the reason why we were going through this is because we don't really want to say that like there is a composite, but rather some class of composites. Yeah, that's right. So, so um, I'm assuming, like, I'm, I'm in a setting where in my context I have my f and g, so, you know, so f and g are fixed for now, but, um, any point in this space is equally a composite of f and g. So it includes, uh, so a point in the space is really the data of a map from the triangle um, together with, uh, that restricts to f and g on the boundary. So there will be lots of points in this space. You know, a picture of one of them is up there. Isn't there gonna be one distinguished one that's like the path, which is f and then g? So in this instance, yes. Um, so, so, and the reason for that, I guess, it, um, so, so yes, absolutely, but it's useless is maybe a way to think about it. We're working inside of a model, right? 
Uh, so right now I'm trying to describe some classical mathematics. Mm -hmm. So yes, sure. So I'm, I'm working with um, you know topological spaces, maybe with some you know, locally <laughs> compactly Kausdorf or some you know, compactly generated spaces, if that means anything to you. Yeah. So right now I'm in, in sort of normal math world. Um, when you say that there is a unique path, which is the composite of you, that's only up to reparameterizing it. Well, I, yeah. So the, so the, so really the whole. Even there, there's a whole space. Yeah, I would, I would say, so there is a, there is sort of a canonical, there's a point that you might specify as like the instance of the composite, but it will be totally useless because, um, you know, the point of having these canonical things is then you can compare them with other canonical things and get other canonical things, and that's what, that's what fails. Again, the, isn't this the usual definition? Because the usual definition is that you concatenate the two paths, you actually, well, you reparameterize whatever, and you then you take the multiple class, because otherwise the things are not defined. Okay, right. So right, if you're used to taking homotopy classes, so if you if you know about the fundamental groupoid, then what I could have said instead is that uh, any path k with a homotopy alpha represents the composite in the fundamental groupoid, so should be considered the composite. Okay. So if you're familiar with that, that's an easier way to say that. But okay. Right, so, that, so the point is that you know, composition is a basic operation in one category theory. In infinity category theory, it's a little weird because anything is only well defined up to a contractible space. Okay, so that's the rest of the proof, but nobody cares about that. Um, okay, so, so this is about computer formalization. So now let's try to give a computer formalization about all of this. And um, I'll start with just an observation which is, you know, there are these very large math libraries. I mean, remember, Lean's math lib contains the liquid tensor experiment. That's awesome. It doesn't contain any of this infinity category theory. Yeah. There are three formalizations that contain the definition of a quasi-category. Okay. Math lib has one. Um, the one lab has it in a branch, and Agatha category says one, but it's a little weird. Okay, so, right. so we, we have, can't go beyond that. Right. So we have some definitions of an infinity category, but I'll, I'll say there's no infinity yeah. category theory, and you might ask why not. So it's not that this is harder than the rest of the, the math that's in there, but it's kind of more annoying to um, do. And the reason is, you know, to, uh, I mean, to, to even start, I need to um, give a precise definition of an infinity category, which I haven't done here, but of course you could, and quasi-category is a name for one of these precise definitions, but it's not the only name that's in use. There's also these things called complete Siegel spaces. Um, and then I would, you know, so that's kind of like putting coordinates on your abstract vector space. And then every single other thing you have to do has to be in reference to those specific coordinates, but somebody else over here uses different basis and like, you know, you have to then redevelop everything in this other basis, but it's, it's sort of worse than that. Um, you know, the change of basis operation is like way more complicated in this setting. It involves equivalent equivalence between model categories. And like, those things have a direction and like, I don't know. So it just kind of, I mean, this, this could totally be done and it's not more difficult than things that have been done, but the proofs are like the wrong proofs somehow because they're not conceptual and they're just bogged down in these technical details that are tied to the set theoretic model. So this is why I think this has not been done yet. Um, there's sort of other things that are more worthwhile to do. Um, and this is kind of a problem. I mean, not like, I don't know that it's a problem that there's no infinity cat. Well, it is sort of a problem that there's no infinity category theory in MATLAB because there's a lot of research papers today that use this. And you, you know, those papers are completely inaccessible to formalization unless you put the infinity category theory in there. So that's, that's a real issue. Um, you know, but it's also sort of an issue for mathematicians who aren't engaged in computer formalization. I mean, they're, you know, my poor colleagues in number theory are reading these papers that use infinity category theory, and they're like, I don't have time to go learn infinity <laughs> category theory. You know, the only way that, so either they have to like, you know, in their theorem cite a whole bunch of theorems that they don't understand, um, or we need to make this subject simpler, you know, and I would prefer to make the subject simpler than have like mathematicians have to rely on theory that they don't understand, you know. And it's just because it's, it's just too complicated to explain in a concise, you know, either to a proof assistant or to a human mathematician, it's too complicated to explain in a concise manner. Um, and so this is, you know, I, I, you know, I'm one of these sort of mainstream mathematicians who, you know, got a PhD without knowing any of the axioms of set theory. Um, but now I'm very interested in foundations, and this is sort of why. So what I'm going to describe now is that if we say, Okay, so infinity category theory, this specific area is not a great match for set theory. Let's find a foundation that is a better match for infinity category theory. It doesn't have to be the foundation for all of mathematics, but it's gonna make it easier for me to do my work rigorously. 
Um, you know, that's sort of what the rest of this talk is about. And this is one particular proposal for this. It's not kind of a complete foundation for infinity category theory. This is early stages, but this is where I would like to see the subject go in the future. And I can imagine there are other areas of mathematics that could benefit from similar ideas that won't look quite like this, but something different. So. And a proof assistant really, really helps, as I'll try and illustrate. Okay, um, so uh, what this is gonna be, so thank you so much for your talk yesterday. What I'm gonna describe now is something called simplicial type theory, and it's very similar to the cubicle uh, type theory that we presented. So it's based on homotopy type theory. Uh, homotopy type theory is a great ingredient here, specifically for infinity category theory, because homotopy type theory is kind of a, it's a theory where types are infinity groupoids. So the, the primitive concepts are already these sort of building blocks of infinity category theory. So you can see why that would be a great place to start. Okay, so this is meant to be a preview of um, what this is all going to look like at the end, and then I'm going to go back to the beginning and explain a little bit the formal system and then how this goes. So, um, so firstly, in homotopy type theory, um, we can think of these types as being infinity groupoids. I haven't really explained what an infinity groupoid is, but this is sort of the fundamental bit of structure. So in homotopy type theory, I guess like in most dependent type theory, we have, you know, a type has a family of identity types over a pair of terms. So Going forward, anything in red is the name of a type, and anything in orange is the name of a term. So, um, and in homotopy type theory, we interpret a term P in the identity type X equals Y as a path from X to Y. And in particular, there's no expectation that those types have only one term. In many cases, they have lots of terms that are uh, unrelated. Um, so this simplicial type theory, we're going to have, so types will have identity types, so that bit's totally normal for uh, homotopy type theory. But each type will also have a family of HOM types, and the terms here we're going to call arrows. So um, between two terms, x and y in a type, we have both the paths, those are the terms in the identity type, and also the arrows. A difference is the arrows are directed, so having an arrow from x to y does not guarantee an arrow from y to x, whereas paths are reversible. So they're sort of probing two different structures in the type. Um, those structures will be related later, but are, right now are unrelated. And so imagine what I've explained a formal system where you have all this stuff, plus a, a few other things. The point of this is we can now give an actual definition of an infinity category that is rigorous relative to this formal system. And it's not crazy hard. So what makes a type into an infinity category is two different two axioms. So the first one is that every pair of composable arrows, so an F that goes from X to Y and a G that goes from Y to Z, will have a unique composite defining in particular a term. And so there's something weird going on already because what I explained is, you know, we're trying to capture a particular area of mathematics where composition is not unique. Um, but I just, the first axiom is that composition is unique. And the reason that this works is when you interpret homotopy type theory back into traditional mathematics, uniqueness becomes contractibility. So within the formal system, this really does behave like I have a unique composite and in particular I have a well-defined composition function. But in the interpretation of this back into set theory, um, back into where infinity categories are traditionally defined, this says that the space of composites is contractible, which is exactly what is true. So this is the right axiom. And it's wonderful in the formal system, and the complexity is in the interpretation back into set theory. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, how do you state this? Do you say that there exists a function? So I will. I will state this all. Things? This is the preview. I will state it formally okay. in, a, in a little bit. Yeah. yeah so, but it, uh, if you know the me what it means to say that a type is contractible, uh, it is exactly that. Um, but I haven't named that type for you. It's an extension type which I'll define in a little bit. Okay, so then there's a second axiom, which says that paths are equivalent to isomorphisms. So this is an axiom that's uh, maybe not surprising if you're an expert, a little weird otherwise, but it's connecting the sort of path structure and the arrow structure. So it's not crazy that we need a connection like that. Um, the thing that is a little weird is, I, you know, if I were defining an ordinary category, I would also mention identities and associativity, and those are actually theorems, so that's why they don't appear. So this is, this is the preview, <coughs> and um, the point is like, so what's difficult here is again setting up the formal system, but when you're given a proof assistant, you're given the formal system, doing the mathematics within the formal system is much simpler, you know, so there's, uh, and that's kind of why I hope that in the future, um, 
this will be accessible to mathematicians at a much earlier stage. But because they will you know, come up learning informal dependent type theory instead of informal set theory. Yeah. Uh, in this definition, you say it has a unique composite. What does composite mean if not? Yeah, let me come back to that. So this is, this is meant to be the preview, and now I'll do it all again. So I need, I need to, there's a few things I need to explain, obviously. But uh, to do that, I should explain the formal system. Uh, I, let me explain the proof of system a little bit. So sorry, I guess I'm explaining the formal system. So um, right. So, uh, so simplicial type theory is similar to cubical type theory, which we saw last time. Um, so um, as uh, Reed explained, uh, types can depend on a context that involves types, but also um, what did you call them? Co-fibrations in cubes. Uh, so similarly, um, the, the sort of co-fibration in cube layer is a thing that we call shapes. And we think of these shapes as uh, polytopes cut out of a directed cube by some sort of formula. And that's it's exactly the same idea. So, so the bottom, um, but I, I guess I'm, I'm packaging it a little, a little bit differently because uh, you know, I, th I think of these sort of bottom two layers together as defining some sort of uh, subshape of a directed, um, you know, of a directed cube. So that's sort of the cube layer plus the co-fibration layer together. And what's going to be important for, so, I mean, you know, there's a paper that in several pages explains all of the rules for these two layers. I'm not going to present that to you right now. Um, but what's important to take away is that um, you know, we have some syntactic language that allows us to define some particular shapes, and I'm going to introduce those particular shapes to you. So firstly, um, we have these shapes that are called simplices. So that's delta n, where n goes from 0, 1, 2 as a natural number. Um, so delta 0 is another name for the point. That's kind of like the, the terminal cube. Uh, delta 1 is uh, the directed one cube. So we think of our, our cubes as being directed because there's no operation that reverses the components. Uh, delta two is then a shape that sits inside the directed two cube. And it's, you can think of it as being sort of a subshape that sits below the diagonal or above the diagonal, depending on which way you've drawn it. When you yes. say directed, are you talking about the zero to one or the dimension? Uh, what I mean is the zero to one. is. It, so there's no map from the one cube to itself that swaps 0 and 1, so, um, which is different from the, the way the cubes sometimes behave in, in cubical type theory. So that's the main point of difference. So the, do, do the cubes like somehow make truth values? So the, so the cubes are just kind of cubes. So mm -hmm. you know, cubes are where sort of cube variables live. Um, we have. Uh, However, predicates on the cubes, that, that these are these co-fibrations, which are used to carve out subshapes. So in particular, within the two simplex, that's the solid triangle, we have the boundary of the two simplex, which you can, and so um, what it is syntactically is it's encoded by this expression. And what it, you should think about is it's the pairs of points in the solid triangle that are on the boundary. And why are they on the boundary? So, so this condition says you're in the two simplex. And Either you know, one of the coordinates is 0, or the two coordinates are equal, or one of the coordinates is 1. That says you're on one of the three edges that comprises the boundary of 2, 2. So there's a lot of technical details here, but the, the point, again, is we can describe the simplices and then further subshapes of the simplices. So I mentioned the two simplex when we were discussing composition previously. I also mentioned a particular sort of horn-shaped subspace of the two simplex. Those are the points in the two simplex so that either one coordinate is 0 or the other coordinate is 1. That's like the composable pair at the end of a 2 simplex. So we have these sort of basic shapes. And then the other thing we have are extension types. So I'm presenting them in a simpler way than you are, because uh, your way is too hard. <laughs> so, <laughs> it is really hard, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, there's, so everything is allowed to be dependent on some context, and there's no context here. That's what, that's what I've simplified. But, um, so here's, here's how I think about extension types. So you have some sort of an inclusion of shapes. So I should think of this phi and psi as being two different subshapes of some cube, some, you know, some common cube. And, and there's an inclusion. Uh, you know, syntactically, that means that's like entailment or something. And then I have some type, which could depend on all this stuff, but it's not <coughs> Let's not worry about that. And then I have some map. So you're allowed to map from a shape into a type, not from a type into a shape, but from a shape into a type. 
And I have a map on the smaller sheet. So the formation rule for extension types says, first I get to form a new type in that situation. And then a term in this type is a map from the larger shape into A. That's secretly like the elimination rule. Um, satisfying this condition that on the smaller shape, it restricts judgmentally to the thing you started with. So that's the idea of an extension type, is it's, um, you know, if you are willing to have this be a proposition, you can just sort of build this using the language of homotopy type theory, but it's nice to have that true judgmentally. So uh, that's the whole idea. Okay, and um, there's a lot of like things you might expect about extension types. So for instance, if you had, you know, Three, if you have two subshape inclusions, something is in something is in something else, then to extend from here to here, you first extend to here and then extend to here. There's a bunch of theorems like that that you can prove are equivalences of types um, in this framework. So we don't need a lot of rules for extension types. We can prove the kind of theorems that we want, which is a very nice feature. I assume that's true in cubicle, too. Um, just a slight technical question. Um, so for your type of co-fibrations, do you have like an internal type cough, or is this a uh, judgment? Right, uh, so for us, no, we actually just explain, so, so, so like you, we have axioms saying um, that, you know, actually, you know, if you have two terms in the same cube, then x mm -hmm. equals y is a co-fibration, yeah. um, and then we have uh, and or true, false. Yeah, less than, yeah, 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 but it is a judgment. Yes, okay. so, yeah, so it's a judgment, it's not a internally encoded, but. Yes, we don't have a classifier for them, but um, great. Okay, so all of this, there's a proof assistant for all of this, and that's what's going on uh, here if you want to kind of follow along here. So how this project started is um, Mike and I wrote this paper like in 2017, and then uh, Nikolai Kutasov, who's uh, somebody we didn't know at the time, just kind of for fun, built a proof assistant um, that encodes this particular type theory. and. Uh, and there it is. <laughs> so, so, um, so this formalization is in a real proof assistant, and it's a real proof assistant that was written by one guy in Haskell. Um, and I don't know, it's just kind of amazing that like you can formalize mathematics in a, a proof assistant with one developer. I mean, he's, uh, um, but it's not bad. I mean, it's, uh, well, I'll, I'll say sort of more about it later. Um, he's, um, you know, there's like a demo website thing so you can play around with it without installing it and everything it's kind of sort of a bunch of documentation um, it has sort of no creature comforts so um, you know I I was used to Agda some people were used you know if you're used to Agda or Lean or Hawk or something like that this is a wake-up call so <laughs> you know so I've learned a lot about um, how difficult it is to make things in a proof assistant by what's missing in RZK so for instance we're missing implicit arguments <laughs> so, <laughs> so so you give every argument for everything every time. Um, you know, there's also sort of no holes, there's no tactics. I mean, right now we don't have inductive types, you know, but we, there's still a lot of infinity category theory you can formalize without those things. If you have extension types, it's a trick that makes you avoid implicits, so let's okay. keep it around. Yeah. Yes, um, you know, we do have syntax highlighting, we have a VS Code extension, so like that's not bad. Um, okay, um, and uh, you know, so my experience of it, I mean, it's kind of, uh, I find I have to be extremely focused because, you know, to, to write a formal proof in this proof assistant, you just have to write the name of the term correctly, and then it'll check and check that it's, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, I mean, it's kind of, there's something kind of meditative about it, like, you, you know, I've, I've, I'm, when I'm formalizing an RZK, I'm like very much in the zone, because if you're not that focused, then there's no point in writing anything, because it's, you know. Um, is there, um, how, what is the notation for the extension types that you're yeah, so I'll show you some of that. Uh, um, I mean, it's not wonderful, but it's not terrible. Um, I'll, sh I'll show you some of that. Um, um, okay, so anyway, we, you know, there's this obvious goal that you would try to formalize if you're trying to formalize some infinity category theory. It's something called the innate dilemma, which is sort of a fundamental theorem in a sense, um, and surprisingly difficult. And uh, we did that. Um, but um, what's particularly interesting about it is, again, kind of back to the, the sort of meta point, is having this proof assistant really makes the mathematics easier. So um, we have a direct, you can give a, a sort of direct comparison between the formal proof of the infinity 
of the Yunaid lemma in this proof assistant and the proof of the ordinary one categorical Yunaid lemma and some other proof assistants. So this is uh, the IV Unimath version is the thing that I linked there. And this one is actually shorter. And that, again, is what having this sort of synthetic framework that's optimized for your particular subject area buys you. Now, if I formalize the proof of the innate dilemma plus the interpretation of this in set theory, of course, then that would be massively longer. But you know, that sort of interpretation is something that, like, conceptually you figure out once, and you don't want to do every single line, in between every single line of every single proof. Yeah. 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 Are, are you? Saying that if you want to let's say, prove something you like the lemma then for the infinity category, that it's really almost the same as just the one categorical search, or is yes. it just yeah, it was right. It's much it's much more similar, and in fact, it's sort of shorter. Um, the kind of naturality is for free. So, um, and I'll um, likely won't make that point, but that point is made on these slides later on. Okay, so let me, so there's some stuff that I didn't explain before, which is what exactly composition is, yeah. Um, so, so you said that like, uh, if you were to formalize the, uh, well, formalize inside this, this proof, and then also uh, translate that, you know, like interpret it into the original, then that would be a much larger proof. Sure. But maybe the argument is that, you know, you only do that interpretation work once, and then like, as you prove more and more things, then it sort of starts to pay for itself if you were to try to prove them all in the original. Yes. Do you think that, like, do you have any sense of like what that cutoff is, like whether you're <laughs> close to it or whether, you know, uh, like is it paying off basically? Right, I mean, for me, yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a very important point. Um, uh, so I think a lot of mathematicians are really driven by aesthetics, and for me it's paying off immediately because the aesthetics of these proofs are much nicer. And um, you know, so whether actually on a sort of runtime, line for line basis, one thing is more efficient than another is kind of not the point. Um, uh, so I don't but know. And I mean, in particular, like referring also to this interpretation business, like if the interpretation business is. Like we've made that so much more complicated than like if we had just done infinity category theory directly. Uh, like is the interpretation really that, not that much harder than just writing down infinity category in the first place? Right, and so I think the interpretation is actually much more complicated just because interpreting type, you know, any sort of type theory and any sort of category theory is already very complicated. There's like a lot of coherence that happens there and that's what's giving you sort of this nice sandbox within which to work. So, so I do think it's making it more complicated, but I also think it's worth it. And you know, that's a personal point of view. Well, which perhaps another way to put it is that this is the correct language, and so there shouldn't be a translation, or there needn't be a translation. And, and again, I'm not so much arguing. I mean, I like the simplicial type theory because I'm close to it, but it, I'm not arguing for that more so than that. Like this set of ideas that, like this, you know, this might be a way forward for mathematicians who are working in particular areas that are very complicated to write rigorously. And you can really see it in the, the literature, you know, a, a paper on infinity category theory, people say, we're gonna work model independently. And what that means is like, we're not gonna choose a, a precise, I'm not gonna explain how to encode anything precisely into set theory. And the reason is like, that's much more conceptual. You know, those proofs are a lot nicer, but they're a lot harder to formalize because they're a lot further from being rigorous. And what this is letting us do is we're, we're being rigorous somewhere else, <laughs> you know. Could you imagine a, a paper on analysis saying we are working with a uh, model independent real numbers? We don't care if they are uh, Cauchy sequences or well, that's all of them, right? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's my point. But imagine one that said that explicitly. You would be like, "Am I missing something? Isn't that the way it should work?" Well, but again, so what model? So model in the infinity categorical jargon is is a much weaker notion, it's not, it's not sort of models of, in, in the way that's used in the rest of mathematics. Um, it really is something that's, you know, fairly imprecise. I mean, it's precise in a sense, but not, but not precise in a sense that would be formalizable. You know, you couldn't, yeah, anyway. Okay, let me, let me try and make the composition bit a little bit more rigorous, and then at some point I'm just going to stop and uh, show you sort of what this looks like in the syntax, because I was asked about that as well. So, um, Right, so I said there's two axioms that define an infinity category, and the interesting one is about composition existing uniquely. So what did I actually mean by that? Uh, so firstly, I mentioned that in the simplicial type theory, we can give any type of family of HOM types depending on two terms. And here is how that family is defined. It's using extension types. 
So, so this HOM AXY is shorthand for an extension type. And it's the extension type whose terms will be maps from the one simplex, that's like the directed arrow, into A, that are judgmentally equal on the two boundary points to X and Y. So that's exactly what we would think of an arrow is. So that's fairly intuitive. Um, we can think of this as some sort of mapping space. Uh, um, and I, I mentioned that there's this unrelated right now uh, identity type. And the relationship between those two is the second axiom that I'll get to in a bit. Okay. So what about composition? So, um, so the first axiom, uh, I, I said before, is f and g have a unique composite. And here's exactly what I meant by that. So if I have you know, type A, three terms, x, y, and z, and then two composable arrows, so f goes from x to y, g goes from y to z, then that data allows me to form another extension type. And uh, this is the extension type where the subshape is this sort of boundary part of the two simplex mapping via f and g into a. So there's some rules for how mapping out of shapes works that I didn't tell you about that explains that having an f and the g with the same common point gives me a map out of that uh, subshape. And then um, exactly as I sort of tried to motivate semantically beforehand, the data of a composition should be regarded as the two simplex that extends that. So in particular, we have this other edge, which is like the composite path. But, but really, it's that plus the data of the homotopy is the sort of correct way to think about composition data. And to say that something exists uniquely in homotopy type theory, what I mean is that the type of all such, so this extension type that I have right here, should be a contractible type. And what that means is something else. But um, so a type is contractible if it has a term. And for all other terms, there's a path between them somehow the definition of contractibility. Yes? Um, and I always thought, like, hey, if you want to do something like synthetic uh, infinity category theory, that it's the very old types come equipped somehow already with the infinity category stuff, let's say. But here, it's, so it's not the case here that every type is already an infinity category or a pre. Yeah, that's right. So there's something a little bit weird about this particular sort of synthetic framework for infinity category theory. It's not the only choice um, that you could make, but uh, it's one that works for kind of technical reasons involving semantics that we could discuss after if you want. But yeah, it's, it's a little unintuitive, but this, this is one perspective that seems to work OK. Um, so what does this contractibility mean? So if a type is contractible, then in particular it has a unique term. I mean, again, in the sense of homotopy type theory. So the proof of contractibility gives you a term. Um, and if you had any other term, you have a path between them, and so they're interchangeable. Um, so let's call this an inhabitant comp. It's a map from the two simplex into A. Um, I could restrict to the other edge, so that I could restrict to the edge uh, that is the diagonal. And that's how I define this composition. So composition is a well-defined function in this formal framework. Um, it you know, extracts that term and then gets some of the data, and that is what we defined as composition. So, and I can really think of it as a function in this framework. You know, so there's a well-defined function. You can see it in our library that goes you know, under the hypothesis that A is a pre-infinity category. There's a function that takes my f and g and returns the composite. And this is great because you really miss that in infinity category theory, and we have it back. So I mentioned that. Um, we don't have axioms about identities and associativity, and it's because they're provable. So here's how identities work. So, um, and this is similar to the REFL path. Um, and in fact, by the same formula that we saw yesterday, um, this extension type has a term. You know, when, when, when it's extensions from x, when we're going from x to x, there's a canonical term, namely the constant function. And we can use that for the identity arrow. And what I can prove is that in a pre-infinity category, I have a relation like this. So in a pre-infinity category, composition is well-defined. So when I have my f, I can compose it with the identity arrow, and I get an arrow like this, which goes from x to y. I also have f, which is an arrow from x to y. So I can form the identity type between f and f-composed identity x. And I can look for a term in, in here. And there is a way to define a term in here um, which follows from the contractibility. So I can show anybody that proof in the repository if they want to see it. Um, and similarly, we have associativity. That's just a theorem. So, uh, so the statement is that if I have f, g, h, and a is a pre-infinity category, so it has this unique composition. So then I have g composed f and h composed g composed f, and f and 
H plus G and the composite of those things. Those are both terms in the HOM type from X to W. And so I can form the identity type and try and construct a term in there. And you can just give a construction. And essentially how it works is there relies on a lemma that says that if A is a pre-infinity category, then the type of arrows in A is also a pre-infinity category. And what I've drawn here is a composable pair of arrows in the arrow infinity category of A. And when I compose those arrows, I get a sort of shape like this by currying. That's a map from the sort of prism delta 2 cross delta 1 into A. And inside that prism is some three simplex. And in particular, I have this diagonal L edge L and some two simplices that witness that this L is both the composite of H composed G and F and H composed G composed F. And I compose those paths. So anyway, there's a proof that you can do. Okay, so I want to mention the second axiom, and then I think I'll just jump to some code. So this, uh, so, so, sorry, that was meant to be a precise description of the first axiom plus some consequences. So the second axiom uh, is relating these arrows to paths. And it's not that arrows are necessarily related to paths, but the arrows that have the property of being isomorphisms are related to paths. And what do I mean by an isomorphism? Um, so here's what you might think I mean by an isomorphism. So you know, in an ordinary one category world, if I have an arrow from x to y and an arrow from y to x, and the composites are identities, then that's an isomorphism. And you can form a type that says that there exists some g from y to x so that the composites are identities. So a term in that type would provide data of all of that. Uh, but in homotopy type theory, uh, we worry about whether or not a type is a proposition, so whether it has uh, a unique, whether it's contractible if it's inhabited. And this is a type that's not necessarily contractible if it's inhabited. So it's better to define isomorphisms in this way. So a priori asking for a distinct left and right inverse. Later, you prove that they agree. But um, this is just one of these things that comes up in the type theory. And so from this, we can form a type of isomorphisms. So uh, to give an isomorphism from x to y, what I give firstly is an arrow from x to y. And then I also give this unique, if it exists, data that witnesses that that arrow is invertible. And the point of this is this is going to be a subtype of the HOM type, so it's just a property of an arrow, whether it's an isomorphism or not, not additional structure on that arrow. And uh, that's how we define understand the second condition. So there's a canonical map from the identity type to the type of isomorphisms. So in particular, um, that's defined somehow by just sending reflexivity to the identity arrow. Um, so this is a trick we call path induction. It's the elimination for the identity type rule. But anyway, there's a canonical way to convert a path into an isomorphism. And um, to say, that, so the second <laughs> axiom, what it meant precisely is that this map is equivalence. So, uh, so in other words, all isomorphisms can be understood to come from paths. It's a, um, some <coughs> okay, what? reminiscent of a uh, unique type. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. So the, so in the infinity categorical literature, this is either called the completeness condition or sometimes the univalence condition. <coughs> it's yeah, some sort of univalence inside. I don't know, Nima, how, this is like univalence inside the category. How, how do you describe this when you talk about this sort of thing? Univalence inside some common field object. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, absolutely. Very good. Okay, and um, what this allows us to do is uh, sort of understand um, you know, some infinity categories as infinity group weights. What that ought to mean is that all arrows are invertible. Or, uh, you know, so all arrows are isomorphisms. Um, and yeah, and anyway, yes. Um, yeah, so it was like when does this um, like in the in the type theory the whole everything that you can construct in, is this one gigantic infinity category or are we thinking of this as like a bunch of different you know, like every type is its own category and they talk to each other or something? Yeah, so the right thanks thanks for that clarification. So you know I'm really interested in not just giving a definition of what an infinity category is, but proving theorems about infinity categories. So understanding the junctions between infinity categories or this Yaneda lemma or limits and colimits and stuff like that. So um, what this synthetic language is allowing you to do is understand when a type is an infinity category, and then we use the axiom. So suppose A and B are infinity categories, then an adjunction is blah, 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 blah. So that's 
So that's, yeah, so you think of the types themselves as infinity categories, and we're in some, you know, kind of infinity two category of infinity categories or something. Well, like if you want to construct an infinity category, mm -hmm. then you need to have some. Yes, so, right, so I mentioned that this is kind of a preliminary formal language for infinity category theory, and it's, it's not at all strong enough to develop all of infinity category. Um, and, you know, right now where it really fails is in construction examples of infinity categories. And analytically, that's hard too, actually, giving examples of infinity categories is somehow harder than proving theorems about infinity categories, so it's maybe not surprising. But yeah, there's a lot of limitations, and there are people who are working on more complete type theoretic frameworks for infinity category theory, but this is what we have right now. So. That's not so surprising because proving theorems about uh, infinity categories, you are working inside of a reasonably simple type system, but to give examples, you necessarily are going through a, a, a semantics, which is. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, yeah. It's not surprising that that's hard, but it's thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so let me stop here and just jump to the code a little bit so you can see what that looks like. So, there's, um, as I mentioned, these slides are on the web. And what you can uh, read about if you want is the proof of the innate dilemma, but I'm not assuming that that is of interest to anybody. So let's instead find a link somewhere. Uh, let's see if that works. Great. So uh, this is the kind of web-facing version of the repository, which uh, Nikolai set up for us, which is wonderful. Um, so it's got some links to describe the project. I should say um, there's a, this is sort of frozen at an early stage of this formalization project, and there's a more recent version that's here, but for expository purposes, I'm gonna stick in this old version. So um, this proof assistant does not talk to any other proof assistant, so we um, needed some sort of standard uh, results from homotopy type theory that we had to formalize ourselves, and so that's kind of what this hot part is. This is probably the best thing to read first if you're just trying to get a sense of uh, how to understand the library. So um, we have uh, some built-in sigma types. Um, so that's there. Uh, you can see, um, you know, sort of the, the syntax. We, uh, you know, list the dependencies, um, term of type defined in this particular manner. Um, I guess I'll show you a little bit of path algebra. Um, so, uh, there's a built-in uh, eliminate, so the identity types are built in. There's a built-in thing called IDJ, which is the elimination rule for identity types that we kind of redefined that using this thing called end path, the path induction. Um, but I can't scroll on the screen, I have to scroll here. Um, you know, so a reversal of paths is defined by path induction by you know, sending REFL to REFL. Um, concatenation of paths is defined by path induction and so on. And so we've got analogs of all that stuff here. Um, let me jump now to... Are, are those lambdas like uh, path... Lambda, are, are any of these variables path or are, um... Yeah, so the, this lambda here, this slash here is syntax for lambda. So that's um, generally for functions. Um, so, so here, one of the arguments uh, to any path is a family of types over an identity type. And we're saying for all... So this is a base identity type at x for all other points, y for all paths, p, then blah, blah, blah. So that, <laughs> that's the syntax for lambda. Okay, but so there's no like variables, cube which are like inter, yeah, yeah, cube variables or whatever, dimension variables. Right, uh, no. Um, so let, let, let me just, so you're asking a question about the simplicial type theory. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, the library. Um, right. So this is, yeah, so dependent on, so, <laughs> I mean, another thing that's in our library is the, um, all of these files are linearly ordered and we have, you have to think about your, so the dependency is always on anything that's previous in the library. It's kind of fun like that. We don't have imports or anything like that. Ah, okay. it's a single file. Well, it's, I mean, it's, okay. yes, yeah, so, right, so, right, so, so in the repository, there's a number in front of everything to impose the linear ordering. Um, okay, <laughs> so. Um, is a... Right, so, so the, the shapes I told you are subshapes of cubes, and so we have this axiomatic directed cube, which we call Q, because that's the category theorist notation for the walking arrow. Um, and uh, then if I wanted to define a subshape of the cube, what I do is I give a predicate on it that corresponds to the you know, sort of points in the subshape. 
So for example, um, you know, the one cube is, is the true predicate, so that's what top refers to the two simplex, that, so there's a axiomatic inequality tope S less than or equal to T that... Um, Wait, so tope is... Uh, it's, our, it's our name for like a predicate on a cube. I forget what you called them yesterday. Um, it's a co-fibration, right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm close, I can stop at any time. So, uh, right, so I mean, here's some examples of the topes we saw. So I, I mentioned um, uh, that we can understand the boundary of the two simplex as a subshape of the two simplex, satisfying some further predicate, and so that's sort of what's written here. Um, and the horn is a sort of further, as a subshape of that. And um, so what Nikolai's built for us is a tope solver. So, um, you know, so, so the proof assistant will check that, you know, this condition, oh wait, I might have a, oh yeah, that this condition uh, implies this condition. And so it'll understand uh, this boundary as an extension or as, as a larger shape of the smaller shape. So that's, that's really nice. Um, Okay, <laughs> what's the extension types? So, um, so extension types are again built in. Um, what this file does is it uh, proves a bunch of lemmas about extension types. Um, so, uh, right, so an extension type can be understood as like a special case of a dependent a function type or a dependent function type. The, um, everything is generalized in the dependent setting, which I didn't present in the slides, but it's here. And, um, uh, but it's uh, sort of a function that satisfies some side condition, and that's kind of what you're seeing in the syntax here. So this particular lemma concerns uh, an extension type. Um, so so uh, I guess let's look at the context. So we have an ambient cube. So that's one of these directed cubes, I. I have a subshape of the cube that's psi. I have a further subshape of the cube that's phi and you know, phi is really a tope on psi, so that means that phi is a subshape of psi. Uh, then I have some ambient type x, and then I have some uh, type that depends on that, um, depends on the larger of the two things, and then a term that depends on the smaller of the two things. And then this particular lemma is about, um, so I can think about um, dependent functions, you know, if I just look at the sort of typing variable stuff, and then extensions from this uh, cube, and um, those two things can be. Yes. Uh, so I see that it says i is a cube and phi is a. Should I think of that as phi is a function from i to so? Because in the second or on the third line we have phi is a function from psi to so. And I would, you know, my mental type checker is saying psi. It should be like psi of i for some i. Of right. So that's a that's a sort of. Uh, Sure. So I guess, um, so we're, we're allowed to do that. Um, so, so this is a way to say that phi is a function from the same tope, from the same cube i to tope, but in addition, it's a subshape of psi. So this is, this is sort of something that we're... Oh, so they're both essentially functions from i to tope. They're both essentially functions from i to tope, except we have an additional condition that phi is a subshape of psi, and this is a... But is that, does the thing resolve to that? Yes. Or uh, is this syntax actually allowed? Uh, so the other syntax is allowed, um, though I forget exactly how it's, I mean, we, yeah, we, we used to do it the other way, and now we do it this way, and I forget exactly how we did it the other way, but that's a sort of question for Nicolette. Um, I see that I'm being asked to stop, so I will stop. Yeah. <laughs>